Most expensive aviation search in history, over $150 million spent, a decade lost, and still, Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 remained missing. But now, Deep Sea Drone just revealed. Where MH370 went down, a new fleet of underwater drones may have finally found what the world's armies, satellites, and ships could not. Some insiders hoped these machines never succeeded. If the latest sonar contacts hold up, the truth about what happened that night in 2014 and why the initial search went so disastrously wrong might finally surface. But what exactly did the drones discover and why are officials hesitant to reveal it? The answers and the stakes begin with the first unexplained disappearance. At 1.07 a.m., Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 sent its final automated status update through ACARS the digital system that quietly relays a plane's health to the ground. Nothing about that transmission raised any alarms. 12 minutes later, at 1.19 a.m., the cockpit checked in with air traffic control for the last time. The words, Good night, Malaysian 370, sounded routine, unremarkable even. But within moments, the aircraft's transponder went dark, vanishing from civilian radar screens as it crossed the IGARI waypoint over the South China Sea. Military radar, still able to track the plane as a silent blip, recorded an abrupt left turn. MH370 doubled back over the Malay Peninsula, crossing the heart of northern Malaysia in the dead of night. The plane's altitude readings fluctuated wildly. Some radar plots suggested improbable climbs, but most experts now agree those were artifacts, not real maneuvers. What's clear is that the aircraft flew west, then northwest, passing near Penang Island and heading out over the Strait of Malacca. At 2.22 a.m., the last solid radar contact placed the plane near the MEKAR waypoint, close to the edge of Malaysian military coverage. After that, MH370 slipped into a zone where no land-based radar could see it. For the next six hours, the only evidence of its continued flight came from a satellite network, Inmarsat, which registered hourly handshakes, digital pings that confirmed the jet's electronics were still powered and communicating. The final ping came at 8.19 a.m., deep over the southern Indian Ocean, just as the aircraft likely ran out of fuel. After that, all signals ceased. In those first critical hours, the plane's communications fell away one by one. First A-C-A-R-S, then the transponder, then even the faint radar echoes. MH370 became a ghost in the sky, its path pieced together only by the silent traces it left on distant instruments. Each lost signal narrowed the window for rescue and left investigators with only fragments, a handful of times, a scattering of coordinates, and the knowledge that a routine flight had crossed into mystery. Search and rescue protocols did not spring into action when MH370 first went silent. Hours slipped by as air traffic controllers in Kuala Lumpur and Subang struggled with uncertainty, unsure which agency should respond or when to escalate. The official search and rescue alert wasn't issued until 5.30 a.m., over four hours after the last radio contact. By then, the trail was already cold. The first search grids targeted the South China Sea, where controllers believed the plane had vanished. Dozens of ships and aircraft scoured these waters, but their efforts were built on incorrect assumptions. Only after military radar data revealed the jet's westward turn did the focus swing sharply toward the Strait of Malacca and the Andaman Sea. Each pivot meant starting over, with precious time lost and search assets stretched thin. The operation soon swelled into a global effort. 26 countries committed resources, Malaysia, Australia, China, the United States, and many others. The machinery of international search and rescue moved into high gear. At its height, the hunt involved 29 planes, 18 ships, 6 helicopters, and more than 20 satellites. Crews from different nations coordinated flight paths, shared radar snapshots, and relayed any sighting, no matter how minor. The surface search zone ballooned to 7.7 million square kilometers, an area larger than Australia itself. Each day brought new directives and shifting priorities. Some teams chased oil slicks or debris sightings that turned out to be unrelated. Others mapped vast swathes of empty ocean, 
logging thousands of flight hours with nothing to show but blank water and mounting frustration. Satellite imagery poured in by the terabyte, but cloud cover and the sheer scale of the search area overwhelmed even the most advanced systems. The pressure mounted as days passed without answers. Families waited in hotel conference rooms for updates that never seemed to come. International crews rotated through exhausting shifts, aware that every hour lost made recovery less likely. The world's largest search operation was underway, but it was a race against both geography and the clock, one that began with missteps and only grew more daunting as the true scale of the challenge became clear. It would take another breakthrough, one rooted not in surface sightings or radio calls, but in the cold logic of satellite data, to finally narrow the hunt for MH370 to a remote corridor of the southern Indian Ocean. Waves carried the first real evidence of MH370's fate thousands of kilometers from where the jet was last tracked. For 16 months, the southern Indian Ocean remained a blank expanse until July 29, 2015, when a single battered flaperon washed ashore on Reunion Island. Experts at France's aviation lab confirmed it belonged to a Boeing 777, and serial markings tied it directly to the missing flight. The ocean had returned a fragment, but not the answers families and investigators needed. Over the next two years, more than 20 pieces of debris, wing panels, cabin interior, engine cowling, were discovered along the coasts of Mozambique, Madagascar, Tanzania, and South Africa. Each fragment told its own story, torn metal, barnacle growth, sun-bleached paint. Oceanographers traced the likely drift paths of these objects, running computer simulations that modeled how currents, wind, and waves might have carried them from a crash site somewhere along the so-called Seventh Arc. The pattern was clear. The debris could only have come from the remote southern corridor, not the South China Sea or the original search zones. Physical evidence forced investigators to look deeper. Surface searches gave way to a new phase, hunting for wreckage on the seafloor. Australia's Ocean Shield vessel, equipped with the towed pinger locator T-25, began scanning for the faint acoustic signals that might still echo from MH370's black boxes. Crews towed the device at slow speed, listening for a signature ping in an area larger than the United Kingdom. Between 2014 and 2016, more than 279,000 square kilometers of seabed were meticulously mapped. High-resolution sonar traced steep underwater slopes, canyons, and volcanic ridges. Each pass revealed the scale of the challenge. The ocean floor was not a flat plain, but a landscape of hidden valleys and abrupt cliffs. Sonar images produced countless false alarms, metallic shapes that proved to be rocks, shipwrecks, or geological formations. No trace of the jet itself appeared. Still, every debris find on distant shores reinforced the searcher's conviction that they were in the right ocean, if not yet the right spot. The fragments became silent witnesses, narrowing the likely crash zone and driving the hunt ever deeper. As the search pressed on, the world began to weigh the growing cost, financial, political, and human, of chasing answers across the most unforgiving sea on Earth. By early 2017, the search for MH370 had become the most expensive operation of its kind in aviation history. The tally reached $155 million, with Malaysia covering 58%, Australia 32%, and China 10%. Governments had mapped 120,000 square kilometers of seabed, an area nearly the size of England, yet the ocean floor yielded no trace of the missing jet. On January 17, 2017, officials announced the end. The search was suspended, not because certainty had been reached, but because every new pass over the southern Indian Ocean brought only more questions and mounting costs. The decision triggered fierce debate. Some investigators argued that the next logical step was to extend the search, pointing to promising data just beyond the mapped zone. Others, facing tight budgets and political pressure, insisted that the evidence was too thin to justify another round. For families, the announcement landed like a second loss. Not only had the plane vanished, but so had the world's commitment to finding it. Into this vacuum stepped a new player, Ocean Infinity, a private company specializing in deep-sea robotics. Unlike previous government-led missions, Ocean Infinity offered a radically different deal. No find, no fee. 
If they failed to locate the wreck, they would absorb the cost. If they succeeded, they would receive a payout. The proposal appealed to Malaysian officials wary of further open-ended spending and to a public hungry for fresh momentum. In early 2018, Ocean Infinity launched its own search, deploying a fleet of autonomous underwater vehicles to sweep 112,000 square kilometers of seabed, much of it outside the original priority area. These robotic drones worked around the clock, guided by a mix of human expertise and machine learning, probing depths up to 6,000 meters. The technology was state-of-the-art, but the result was achingly familiar. After months of scanning, the mission returned empty-handed. The location of MH370 remained out of reach, and the company received no payment. The pause in official funding marked a turning point. No longer could families or investigators rely on governments alone to pursue answers. The future of the search now depended on innovation and risk-taking from the private sector. Ocean Infinity's approach, combining advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, and a results-driven contract, set a new standard for what might be possible, even when national priorities shifted elsewhere. For the first time, the search for MH370 was not just about recovering the past, but about testing the limits of technology and the willingness to keep looking, even when the world had moved on. Armada 7806 Rides the swells of the southern Indian Ocean, its decks crowded with the latest generation of deep-sea drones. Ocean Infinity's team stands ready to deploy a fleet of Kongsberg Hugin autonomous underwater vehicles, machines engineered for the kind of abyss that swallowed MH370. Each AUV is rated for depths up to 6,000 meters and can operate for nearly 100 hours on a single mission, mapping the seafloor while the mothership stays miles above. This time, the searchers are not relying on a single robot or a single set of eyes. The new strategy is a swarm. Multiple AUVs move in coordinated patterns, communicating with each other and the ship, covering overlapping strips of the 15,000 square kilometer search box. The terrain is anything but forgiving. Steep slopes, volcanic seamounts, and canyons that can hide debris from even the most advanced sensors. But these vehicles are equipped for the challenge. Side-scan sonar sweeps wide arcs along the bottom, while synthetic aperture sonar builds images sharp enough to reveal a twisted wing or a section of fuselage. Multi-beam echo sounders trace the contours of underwater cliffs, and sub-bottom profilers peer beneath the sediment, searching for anything buried by a decade of ocean currents. Every second, the AUVs gather gigabytes of data, raw sonar returns, sub-bottom echoes, camera stills, all processed by onboard computers running neural networks trained to spot the faintest trace of wreckage. Only the most promising anomalies are flagged and beamed back to the mothership for review. There, Ocean Infinity's analysts and Kongsberg engineers sift through the digital stream, scoring each contact by its shape, reflectivity, and the probability it's man-made. If a target looks right, the swarm pivots. Drones are retasked to rescan the area, this time at lower altitude and higher resolution. The search box stretches from roughly 1,560 to 2,400 kilometers west of Perth, chosen for its overlap with new drift models and satellite data. The seafloor here is among the most rugged on Earth, a landscape of canyons and ridges where previous missions struggled with sonar shadows and navigation errors. But the Armada 7806 fleet is built for this, using real-time terrain mapping and obstacle avoidance to keep the drones safe and the data continuous. With a weather window from January through April, every sortie counts. The $70 million contract, payable only if the wreck is found, adds urgency, but the real pressure is in the data. Each pass over the abyss is a test. Can this technology succeed where years of effort and hundreds of millions of dollars have failed? Richard Godfrey sits at the center of a global debate. A retired aerospace engineer, he believes the world's amateur radio network holds a digital shadow of MH370's final hours. His analysis of weak signal propagation reporter, WSPR, logs points to 313 anomalies, faint disruptions in radio signals that he argues line up with the missing jet's projected path across the Indian Ocean. In his view, each anomaly is a possible tripwire, 
triggered as the Boeing 777 crossed between distant transmitters and receivers, leaving a pattern of invisible footprints where radar and satellite coverage failed. But the promise of WSPR as a breakthrough is tangled in controversy. Independent radio scientists and leading signal experts, including Simon Maskell's team at the University of Liverpool, have spent years testing the method. Their results are sobering. Most supposed anomalies are indistinguishable from the background noise of the network. Aircraft can, in theory, disrupt these signals, but the odds of reliably tracing a flight path, especially at transoceanic distances, remain low. Peer-reviewed studies in 2024 and 2025 found that false positives are common with error rates as high as 40%. No official investigative body has accepted WSPR as a primary search tool, and even Ocean Infinity treats the data as a supplementary hint, not a guiding light. For families, each new theory brings a surge of hope and a wave of caution. The Coalition Voice 370 has spent a decade pressing for transparency, accountability, and dignity. They have watched as search zones shifted, as debris finds raised and dashed expectations, as new technologies promised answers that never quite arrived. Some relatives welcome any lead, no matter how speculative, while others worry about the toll of repeated disappointment. The emotional cost is measured in years of waiting, in birthdays missed, in the ache of not knowing. As Ocean Infinity's drones continue to scan the depths, several promising sonar contacts are under review. But with no confirmed wreckage yet announced, the search remains suspended between science and hope. For the families, closure means more than a headline or a theory. It means an end to uncertainty and a chance to finally bring loved ones home. Until then, every anomaly, every signal, and every silence carries the weight of a decade's longing. After more than a decade, the search for MH370 remains the most expensive in aviation history, with over $155 million spent and more than 120,000 square kilometers of seabed examined by 2017. Confirmed debris, including the flaperon found on Reunion Island in July 2015, and over 20 other fragments, established the jet's fate in the southern Indian Ocean, but the main wreckage has never been located. Today, Ocean Infinity's autonomous underwater drones are scanning a new 15,000 square kilometer area west of Australia, using technology capable of reaching 6,000 meters deep. While promising sonar targets have been identified, no official confirmation has been released. Disputed radio signal evidence and classified data still leave key questions unanswered, especially for families seeking closure. What is clear, the search has combined unprecedented international cooperation, advanced technology, and persistent uncertainty. As new findings await verification, the story of MH370 stands as both a lesson in the limits of investigation and a testament to the enduring quest for answers.